Alrighty, everyone. This is the big one. We've seen the Railway Series timeline. We've seen the CGI timeline. Now it's time for the most complex timeline of them all. The Model Series timeline of Thomas the Tank Engine. Twelve seasons and two movies of lore to be placed in a linear sequence of events. There's a reason I put this one off till last. That reason being I knew it was going to be the most complex one. The Railway Series timeline is also complex, yes, but it actually wasn't too hard to make. Wilbert Audrey laid out all the information just out for us in the Island of Sodor book, and I just took everything from that and the books and placed them in order. The CGI timeline was even easier, as they didn't really get too far into lore in those seasons or really pay mind to nitty gritty details. The model seasons though, oh boy, it's lore galore, scattered and often inconsistent. It was a real chore to put all this together, not going to lie, but I think I have figured it all out for the most part and I'm pretty happy with the end result. So before we get started, let's go through the usual disclaimers. 1. This is a timeline that includes all of the model seasons, so that includes the later hit seasons. I am aware that there are unfortunate inconsistencies, mostly character stuff. The Scarlowy in Season 10 is not the same Scarlowy in Season 4, and I hate that just as much as you all do. I'm tired. But putting all that aside, the overall big picture continuity stays fairly consistent in all of these seasons. Things like the Scarlowy Railway always goes to an incline quarry. Arlesdale End is always where Toby's shed is. Peter Sam consistently has his new funnel after his old one falls off. After the clay pits close, Bill and Ben are always seen working at Farquhar Quarry, etc. There's also continuity between the eras, like how Emily is consistently at Knapford Sheds until she moves to Tidmouth. Arthur is always on the coastal line, etc. The hit era is generally inconsistent most of the time in terms of geography and where everything is placed. So I don't take what that era of the show presents us so literally, unless it's a location that's placement is integral to a story or something, like Great Waterton. So bear with me here. 2. Some of the stuff I present here are connections that I've made myself. Some of this is headcanon and not hard fact. I've taken some of my own creative liberties here and rearranged the order of episodes to fit an overall narrative. Stuff like Percy in Season 2 talking about events that didn't happen until Season 3. Since there's no hard evidence that every episode takes place on a specific date, unlike the Railway series, I think we're allowed some creative leeway here to rearrange things. A lot of this is also tailored to my Island of Sodor map, so also keep that in mind. Please take what I present here with a grain of salt. 3. Thomas and the Magic Railroad ain't canon. No matter which way you work it, there is no way this godforsaken movie can work in the lore of the show. It just can't. The movie establishes that magic is a thing in this universe. There are all these human characters, and the engines can somehow drive themselves, and nothing in that movie is ever referenced again. This would make Diesel 10 simply a big bully diesel that just appears out of nowhere in calling all engines, which I'm fine with, and Lady just a figment of Thomas's imagination. And you know what? If you're going to write a magical engine into your real life based train show, that's how you do it, and again, I am okay with that. And lastly, I'm again not going to mark years on this, but I am going to give you rough estimates of decades. Okay, now that that's all out of the way, let's get started. Ladies and gentlemen, the entire timeline of Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends. Just like the Railway series, our story begins with the Scarlowy Railway. In the 19th century, a narrow gauge railway is built from the wharf at Ballad Whale to the slate mine at Ward Fell. The railway, called the Scarlowy, was run by two engines called Scarlowy and Reneus. The Scarlowy Railway Company formed a second narrow gauge railway, called the Mid Sodor Railway, which was built running from Scarlowy to Peel Godred. Together, these two railways created a link from the wharf through the mountains. The railway was more expansive than the Scarlowy, and went west to a river harbor terminus at Valesbridge and scattered mines. Thus, the railway was run by several engines, which included Duke, Bertram, Smudger, possibly Freddy, and whether you like to believe he was real or not, Proteus. 
A lot of people like to believe the engine that fell off the old iron bridge was Proteus, myself included. Whether Proteus was real, or the engine that fell itself, at some point before all the other engines arrived, this engine fell off the old iron bridge and drowned in the swamp below. It and its crew never to be seen or heard from again. The engine fell into legend. A statue of Proteus was later built to honor the lost engine. The railway's second engine smudger kept disobeying orders and derailing. Eventually, the manager had had enough. He removed smudger's wheels and had him turned into a generator behind the shed. The railway received its next two engines called Falcon and Stewart. On Falcon's first run up the mountain road, he derailed and nearly fell down the mountainside. But fortunately, Duke saved him. Coal mines were dug in the foothills on the east of the Sodor Mountains, and a town formulated around the mining hub called Great Waterton. A standard gauge tramway was built from Great Waterton to the wharf at Balladwale. This tramway was the first standard gauge railway on the island, and was run by a fleet of tram engines. As this was the only standard gauge railway on the island at the time, the railway was simply called Sodor Tramways. At some point later, the Scarlowy and Mid-Sodor Company decide to build a third railway, running east through Bluebell Valley and into Vickerstown, creating a complete rail link between it and Peel Godred. The narrow gauge tracks actually proved ideal to traverse the hilly terrain north of Croven's Gate. However, the railway didn't see the success they had hoped for, because soon after, the mainland built a bridge across the Walney Channel, and extended their standard gauge railway through Vickerstown to the holiday town of Norrenby. This put an end to the new narrow gauge extension, and the stretch of the line from Vickerstown to Bluebell Valley became disused. In the northwest of Sodor, Sodor Tramways built a second tramway called the Arlesdale Railway, running from the harbor at Arlesbra to Arlesdale End. This railway was run by a small fleet of tram engines, which were very similar to the ones that ran to Great Waterton. One of these engines was called Toby. We'll say around this time, a young Topham Hatt started learning how to drive in his steam lorry called Elizabeth. Sometime later in his young adulthood, Elizabeth was sold off, and then later left in a wooden shed, forgotten about. A mining network opened in the heart of Sodor near Olstead, including a stone quarry, a lead mine, a coal mine, and the gold mine which was shared with the Mid-Sodor Railway. A new single-track standard gauge railway was built to transport the goods to the original Knapford Harbor. A coastal track around the headlands was later built so the railway could reach Tidmouth. Another standard gauge railway is built in the south along Sodor's Peninsula, a short line from Wellsworth to the harbor at Brendam. At long last, all the standard gauge railways on Sodor came together and decided to formulate one big railway, the North Western Railway, with Sir Topham Hatt as its controller. Two engines from the mainland came to Sodor to help construct it. One was an older little tender engine called Edward, and later came a tank engine called Thomas. Together they all built the main line from Vickerstown to Knapford and connected all the railways in big towns. Tunnels were carved through the hilly terrain above Croven's Gate, a huge suspension bridge was erected across the River Hoo, a massive viaduct was built over the River A, and another tunnel was cut on the west side to connect Ellsbridge and Tidmouth. The new mainline connection closed the remaining part of the narrow gauge line to Vickerstown, and the whole line fell into disuse. The Norrenby line, as it was built by the other railway, held independence from the Northwestern with its own controller. I like to think it was around this time of the Northwestern's construction that the events of You Can't Win occurred, as Thomas is present at Croven's Gate when Duke and Stewart arrive. A new double-track section of the Farquhar branch was constructed above the old one to meet the new terminus station at Knapford, and also create a loop line for the main line. Knapford opened a much larger harbor south of the new terminus station for the now much larger railway, and closed the original one. The original tracks to it became disused as well. The coal mines in the foothills dried up. With no more industry, the people of Great Waterton all left to move to the new, more populated parts of the island where they could find work. The town was eventually abandoned and fell into disuse, as did the tracks of the branch line to it. But the southern section of the wharf to Croven's Gate would later be maintained for mainline use. The Northwestern acquired three more engines to help run the mainline. 
The next to arrive was an engine called Henry to pull the express. He proved to be an unsuccessful steamer, so another express engine called Gordon was brought, and Henry was kept on smaller trains. A mixed traffic engine called James arrived sometime after. Thomas, meanwhile, was kept at Knapford as the station's pilot engine. I'll also say around these early times, the cement works opened near the coastal cliffs in Kilabon, and a goods line was built to it. The works owned a railway traction engine called Fergus that worked the area, and continues to work there in the series' present day. The show implied that the cement works and Fergus have been around for a long time. And now we start getting into the events of Season 1. The events of Seasons 1 through 4 are all a bit intertwined, so bear with me as I skip around a bit. Henry refused to work in the rain and shut himself up in a tunnel. After several attempts at trying to make him move, the fat controller gave it up and walled Henry up in it. However, when Gordon's safety valve burst and Edward was unable to pull the train alone, Henry was finally let out to rescue it. Thomas, meanwhile, grew bored of being a station pilot and longed to leave the yard. One day, a runaway James raced through. He had an awful crash, and Thomas sprung into action to rescue him with the breakdown train. The Fat Controller was so pleased with Thomas that he awarded him the branch line to Farquhar. Thomas finally left Knapford to run his branch line with his two coaches, Andy and Clarabelle. During his early days, he went fishing, left his guard behind, got stuck in the snow during his first winter on the line, and raced Birdie the bus. The big engines were forced to shunt their own coaches with Thomas gone. Fed up with it, they went on strike until another engine came to do it for them. The Fat Controller purchased a saddle tank, which he called Percy, who arrived and became the station pilot. Henry continued to fall ill frequently, and the Fat Controller had his crew try out special Welsh coal for him. The new coal seemed to do the trick. That winter though, while pulling the Flying Kipper, Henry was diverted onto the wrong line and suffered a high-speed collision. The Fat Controller sent him to crew to be repaired, and he came back in the spring with a new shape and no steaming problems whatsoever. We're in the early 50s now. At some point this year, a landslide blocked the Hackenbeck Tunnel and Mrs. Kindly waved a red dressing gown out her cottage window to stop Thomas and prevent a collision. The Arlesdale Railway started facing struggles as the roads took over their business. The tram engines were all eventually withdrawn and scrapped, with Toby being the last remaining in service. One day, the Fat Controller took his family on holiday to the north, and they all met Toby and his coach Henrietta. A few months after their visit, the services ended entirely, and the Arlesdale Railway announced its closure. Toby's last day was unusually busy. Back on the Northwestern, Thomas got into trouble with a policeman. He was not allowed to travel to the quarry on his branch line without covered wheels. Instead of giving Thomas side plates, the Fat Controller concluded the railway needed its own tram engine, and he wrote to Toby's controller. Toby was purchased by the Northwestern Railway and went to work on Thomas's branch line. That Christmas, the Fat Controller held a Christmas party at Tidmouth Sheds for Mrs. Kindly, as a thank you for her act of bravery earlier that year. A China clay works opened on the Brendam Peninsula, and the industry at the harbor at Brendam began to boom. The clay works acquired two twin saddle tanks called Bill and Ben to transport clay to the docks, and Edward was assigned to services on the branch line to Brendam. An ironworks opened in Peel Godred, and the Northwestern Railway constructed a new branch line up the valley to it, crossing over the mid Soto Railway north of Abbey. This complete through line up the valley would eventually spell doom for the mid Sodor. Edward would bring trucks from the scrapyard on his branch line up to the new ironworks. Edward came across a traction engine called Trevor in this scrapyard. He convinced the Vicar of Wellsworth to save him, and now Trevor lives at the Vicarage Orchard. The gold mine started to dry up and the mid Sodor's western section started to see less and less use. The gold mine closed, and the tracks to it from the mid Sodor and Northwestern became disused. Sadly, Bertram was left behind there at the mine when operations ended. The Scarlowe, meanwhile, faced its own hardships as its only two engines started to grow old and worn out. Scarlowe started failing, so Reneas took over most of the workload. En route back home one stormy day, Reneas's valve gear jammed. 
Determined to get his passengers home, he struggled on and limped the train back despite his cramps. The driver promised Reneas that he would be mended when they found the time. I'll say around this time, the Fat Controller took on full ownership of the struggling Scarlowy Railway, and began looking into ways of refurbishing it, which would include acquiring new engines. The continued dwindling returns forced the Midsota Railway to finally close, and its remaining engines were auctioned off. Bertram had been left behind at the gold mine, Stewart and Falcon went off to work on the Scarlowy Railway, we don't know what happened to Freddy, and Duke was tarped over and left in his shed at the old station. As time went on, the shed was eventually buried by heavy rain and landslides. Later, their drivers promised Reneas and Scarlowy that two new engines, which were Stewart and Falcon, would eventually arrive to help their struggling little railway. When Falcon and Stewart did finally arrive, they were renamed to Sir Handel and Peter Sam respectively. Reneas was still in service at this point, and was sent away to the works sometime after their arrival off-screen. Scarlowy was left in the open shed to rest while Sir Handel and Peter Sam ran the railway. I can only assume there's a bit of a time gap after this, so we'll cut back to the Northwestern Railway, and then come back to the little guys. The Fat Controller decided to reopen the old Knapford Harbor, and promoted Percy from pilot duties to help with the reconstruction. Trevor helped too. Together, Thomas, Percy, and Trevor rebuilt the old harbor. The tracks of the original branch line to it were reopened as a goods line. During the reconstruction, Percy met Harold the helicopter and raced him to the harbor. When the harbor reopened for service, Percy was relocated to work on Thomas's branch line with Thomas and Toby. With Percy away, another bigger tank engine from the Great Western Railway was brought to pilot at Knapford. His name was Montague, but was nicknamed Duck for his supposed waddle. The Fat Controller later trialed a diesel shunter from the other railway called Diesel. Diesel took a dislike to Duck after Duck played a trick on him, and got his revenge by spreading lies about him and getting him sent away to Wellsworth. However, Diesel was found out and sent packing. And after Duck proved himself a hero attempting to stop a runaway train, unsuccessfully I might add, he was brought back to the yard. The growing railway required more motive power, and the Fat Controller sent for an engine from Scotland to pull goods trains. He was astonished when two arrived. The engines were called Donald and Douglas, and the Fat Controller agreed to trial both and then make a decision later on on which would stay. The engines all held a deputation that winter to keep both engines on the island and the Fat Controller allowed it. Donald and Douglas joined the railway, and received nameplates. We've reached the end of the 50s now, and a new decade begins. On Thomas's branch, Thomas foolishly attempted to drive himself, which resulted in him crashing into the station master's house at Tidmouth. He was sent away for repairs, and a diesel rail car called Daisy was brought in to fill in for him. Daisy was snooty and selfish, but promised to be better and when Thomas returned, the Fat Controller kept her on. Boko, the Big Diesel, arrived on Soto around the same time and joined Edward on his branch line. The famous preserved 100 mile per hour record breaker engine, City of Truro, visited Sodor, much to Duck's honor. Gordon wasn't all impressed, and tried to run 100 miles an hour himself to no avail. The hot sun warped the rails on Thomas's branch line. The Fat Controller closed the branch for a little while while repairs were made, and the engines were sent to work elsewhere. Thomas worked in the yard, while Percy went to work with Duck at the ever-growing Brendam docks. Diesel returned for a short stint to help them, only to be sent away again after causing more trouble. While at the docks, Duck discovered his love for the sea, and longed to travel past the horizon. The Fat Controller decided to build a new station near the abandoned port at Arlesbra, and had a new branch line constructed up to it with plans to continue further to the fishing village at Harwick and create a full west coast line. After Duck returned from Brendam, the Fat Controller asked him to run the line. Duck relocated to the branch line and helped finish its construction. Once they reached Callan, the line opened for service. Construction continued on north to Harwick off-screen. Sometime after Tidmouth Halt opened, Thomas tasked Percy in bringing a group of schoolchildren home. En route, it rained heavily and Percy got stuck in a flash flood. He braved through it though, and made it home. After that, on one of his visits to Brendam Docks, Percy gloated about his bravery to Bill and Ben. He got a big head and wound up unwittingly taking another plunge. A massive storm struck Sodor and tore up the forest between Wellsworth and Crosby, much to Henry's dismay. 
He, Toby, Trevor, and Terence all worked together to clean up the mess and plant new trees. Next up are the events of Off the Rails, Down the Mine, and Paint Pots in Queens. Okay, hear me out here. The events of Paint Pots in Queens occur right after Down the Mine, as Gordon still has his winch on from rescuing Thomas and that. Duck and Donald are also present in this episode, which means this trilogy had to occur much later in the series. So let's compromise and say it occurs sometime in the middle during Season 3. Gordon one day refused to pull a goods train, and in an attempt to break the turntable to avoid pulling it, ran himself off it into a ditch. He got the express taken away from him, and was demoted to goods work. Thomas later fell into a mine while collecting trucks at the old lead mine on his branch line. The ground was too weak for cranes, so Gordon was brought up, and he made up for his previous incident by rescuing Thomas. When the duo returned home, they were told of Her Majesty, the Queen, coming to visit the island. When the day came, the Fat Controller allowed Gordon to haul the royal train. We are roughly in the mid-60s now. Diesel started to become more prominent on the island of Sodor. A diesel shunter called Mavis was purchased by the Farquhar Quarry. Diesel also returned to Sodor for a brief time again, in which he gave Mavis bad advice and then told Gordon of Steam Engine's eventual fate. The famous preserved engine Flying Scotsman also visited Sodor, who in this timeline had never met Gordon, as Gordon seemed to not know who he was when he saw him. Douglas took a midnight goods train to Vickerstown and found a little engine called Oliver and his brake van Toad in the exchange yard there, hiding from the scrapyard. Douglas rescued them and brought them to the Northwestern Railway. Oliver was saved by the Fat Controller, who restored him and Toad to their original liveries. They were put to work on the Little Western with Duck. A double-decker bus called Bulgy was brought on during the summer rush. He stupidly attempted to take a shortcut and got himself stuck under a bridge. The Fat Controller decommissioned Bulgy after this, and he was turned into a henhouse in the field beside the bridge he stuck under. Meanwhile, the Fat Controller trialed a diesel from the other railway called Derek on the Brendam branch, but he broke down on his first job collecting trucks from the Clayworks. Derek was sent back soon afterwards. Around this time, Edward went to Croven's Gate for repairs and Scarloe caught up with him. He told him how much he missed Reneus. Later, Sir Handel derailed, and Scarloe was brought out of the shed to take over the train. He broke down en route, but got the train home, and the crew was so pleased with him that they promised to send him away to be mended. After Scarloe left, Rusty arrived to help out and spent ample time inspecting and repairing all the tracks of the railway. During his time exploring, Rusty came across the disused tracks to Bluebell Valley, and in springtime enjoyed traveling along them for fun to see the flowers there. Peter Sam had his accident at the slate quarry which permanently damaged his funnel. Duncan arrived soon after to help out while Peter Sam was out of commission. Another time gap occurred, so let's cut back to the events on the Northwestern. A circus visited Sodor, and James hauled the train. One of its elephants got loose and ran away and hid in Henry's tunnel. A little girl from London wrote to the Fat Controller asking if he could bring all his engines to the mainland so she and her friends could meet them. So he decided to bring his first eight to London for a big display event. Engines one through eight all went, and Oliver, Donald, Douglas, Bill, Ben, Mavis, and Boko stayed behind and took over the work. Harwick was finally reached by rail on the west coast. One of the seaside villages along the route holds an annual festival and they invited Toby up to be their special attraction. Toby traveled up the line to it. However, the plans changed, and Toby was turned away when he arrived. Scarloe returned home from the works, and Peter Sam filled him in on what had happened while he was gone. Around this time, a rescue team set out to find the long-forgotten Duke, and used Scarloe to carry them across the railway. On one of their searches, one of the rescuers fell through the ground onto Duke in his buried shed. Duke was found, dug out and brought to the Scarloe Railway. Note how Peter Sam still had his old funnel when Duke arrived. That winter, the rough winds took their toll on Peter Sam's funnel. Note how Duke was on the Scarloe Railway at this point. Peter Sam's funnel was knocked off by an icicle, and he got a brand new boxy one that proved successful. He has maintained it ever since. That same winter, during a blistery night, Thomas told the other engines Duke's story. Reneus finally returned home from being mended to a big celebration. The Norrenby branch was in search of an engine to run its line, 
Rusty ventured off along the old disused tracks to the exchange yards in Vickerstown, in hopes of finding a steam engine there the same way Douglas had found Oliver. He stumbled across Stepney there, alone and abandoned, and the two escaped. Stepney was purchased by the railway and now runs the Little Lion. He enjoys his life, but grew tired of his short runs and wished for a long run. He got his wish when the Fat Controller brought Stepney to the west of Sodor to visit. During his visit, he made Thomas jealous, raced Caroline, and double-headed the express with Duck when a visiting other railway diesel failed. Stepney left the next day with a huge send-off. And this thus ends all the major events of the first four seasons. After the events of Season 4 complete, I like to think the series starts to enter the late 60s slash early 70s. Season 5 begins where an insane amount of world building occurs and old things rediscovered. Brendam Docks acquired a new crane called Cranky, who later got knocked over when a storm struck the island. He was soon raised though, and then knocked over again, and then raised again. A new branch line was constructed to Kirk Ronan from Kelsthorpe. Kirk Ronan gained a big new canopy terminus station. On the line's opening day, Gordon's brakes failed and he smashed right through the station wall, permanently leaving his mark there. Henry took a midnight goods train to Peel Godred, where he and his crew happened upon Old Bailey, the original station master of the Mid-Sodor station at the crossover. The station is restored by the island's preservation society, with Old Bailey as its keeper. Sometime later, the lake adjacent from the station was drained, and the old Mid-Sodor tracks were pulled up. The track bed was paved over to create a new road link, albeit not very well. Off screen at some point, the Northwestern took charge of the Norrenby line from its previous manager, and the Fat Controller acquired ownership of Stepney. He allowed Stepney to visit the big railway again for a little while to help Toby and Mavis at Farquhar Quarry. On his way back to the east, he made a wrong turn and ended up at the Ironworks. The Ironworks diesels, Ari and Bert, came across him and saw to it that Stepney finally received the scrapping he had cheated before. Luckily, Stepney was saved just in the nick of time by the Fat Controller, and he returned back home to Norrenby safely. The China Clay Works, meanwhile, suffered a catastrophic avalanche that destroyed the entire workings. Bill and Ben acted quickly and managed to save everyone on the site before the disaster struck. The Clay Works unfortunately closed after this. Following the closure, Bill and Ben were relocated to Farquhar Quarry and worked there with Mavis for the remainder of the series. I placed this event a bit later because we see Mavis at Farquhar in Stepney Gets Lost and Bill and Ben aren't present there yet, although they could have just been off screen. Oliver was temporarily reassigned to pull the mail train for a while. On one of his trips coming down from Callan, he was accidentally sent down the abandoned tracks of the old Arlesdale Railway and crashed into Toby's old shed at Arlesdale End. The Fat Controller set out and Harold the helicopter to find Oliver. When they did, he became fascinated with the old railway and decided to reopen it for visitors. Off screen, the Fat Controller acquired the running rights and Toby was relocated to his old stomping grounds to help with the line's reconstruction. Heavy rain caused the Great Dam on the line to collapse, taking out one of the bridges and nearly Toby with it. By the warm months though, the dam was mended and Toby's line was open for service, with its new west terminus at Callan on the Little Western. Sometime later, Toby and the Hat family adventured along the abandoned mining network at the tail end of Thomas's branch, and came across the ruins of Ulfstead Castle and the gold mine. Both began to be refurbished for tourism. During the mine's restoration, Bertram was uncovered. When the mine and castle were reopened as tourist attractions, Bertram was put back into service giving rides to visitors around the mine site. A connection between Arlesdale End and Ulfstead Castle was built, creating a loop, and making Arlesdale End a through station. The castle became a regular stop on Toby's route. Thomas and Percy came across an old Clare... Clearstory? How do you say it again? Thomas and Percy came across an old Clearstory coach at the Ironworks. After a fire broke out at the workman's hut at Tidmouth Halt, the coach was restored and refitted out as housing quarters. She was permanently parked at Halt. However, when Mrs. Kindly's daughter got married later, Thomas and Percy brought old slow coach along to it as a part of a good luck package. The Fat Controller decided to reopen one of the close quarries on the Mid-Sodor Railway, Boulder Quarry. The Scarlowy engines were allowed up the old tracks to it. 
However, the new drillings caused a boulder to become dislodged from its perch. The boulder terrorized the railway and caused significant damage. After the boulder disaster, the Fat Controller decided it was an act of God telling them to leave that part of the island alone, and ceased operations at the quarry forever. The old Midsodor tracks were again left abandoned. For now. Around this time, Sir Handel got into trouble for... something, and was sent away to work at the Slate Mine indefinitely. I assume it was around this time he got sent away, because Sir Handel is absent from the series at this point until Season 10. I'm banishing you to the Shadow Realm. No! Much better! And thus ends the events of Season 5. Probably the most packed season of them all. What a season. A new diesel shunter called Salty was purchased from the other railway and traveled to Sodor over the bridge from the mainland. He worked at Farquhar Quarry for a short while with Mavis, Bill, and Ben. He was later relocated permanently to Brendam Docks, where he still works in present day. The railway also gained a new crane engine called Harvey, who arrived to the island via ship. When Thomas broke down en route to Brendam Docks, his crew came across an old steam lorry in a nearby shed. The lorry was Elizabeth, the Fat Controller's first vehicle. She helped Thomas out, and the Fat Controller is so pleased with her discovery that he paid Jem Cole to restore her to her former beauty. Elizabeth returned to work, and worked mostly on the roads near the Scarlowy Railway. Ned the Steam Shovel caused an old quarry bridge on the Peel Godred line to become unstable, and it collapsed. Jack the Front Loader managed to hold it up in enough time for Thomas to clear it safely, but damaged his arms in the process. Gordon set a new personal speed record, which we will come back to later. Edward temporarily left his duties on his branch line to go help Stepney with the heavy passenger traffic to Norrinby. The Northwestern acquired several new steam engines that the Fat Controller saved from the other railway. The engines were Emily, Arthur, and Murdoch, and they were all stationed at Knapford Sheds. The Duke and Duchess of Boxford paid their first visit to the island of Sodor, and arrived via their private engine called Spencer. For the first time ever, Gordon was shown up by another engine. Lord Callan refurbished his castle estate for tourism, and the castle opened as a new station on the Little Western. Duck and Oliver started running their services up to it. When the summer passenger traffic started to pick up, the Fat Controller decided to give Bulgy a second chance, and brought him back to the roads. After an incident with some chickens, Bulgy was retired from passenger work for the final time, and converted into a mobile vegetable stand. And he quite enjoyed it. Goods traffic on the line to Harwick began to pick up and demanded its own engine to run it frequently. The Fat Controller trialed Thomas, much to Thomas' disdain. After Thomas had an accident, Arthur stepped in and then asked if he could work there. The Fat Controller agreed, and Arthur permanently relocated to Harwick to run the line. The Fat Controller's interest in the old Midsodor tracks never left him, and he eventually had part of the line reopened as a new branch line on the Scarlowy Railway. A grand opening celebration was held at one of the new stations, Rumblin' Bridge. The branch gained another new station called Elephant Park, which opened later. The Fat Controller brought Diesel back again for, what is this, the 57th time now? To help Fergus out at the cement works. Diesel tricked Fergus into leaving the area for the ironworks, but all was put right after Diesel was found out. Shockingly, Diesel wasn't sent home this time and stayed on Sodor. He went to the ironworks for a little while, and then to Farquhar Quarry later to work with Mavis. A giant storm struck Sodor this year. There are several episodes this season that revolve around a giant storm, and I like to think that they all happened at the same time. Each episode sees how the storm affected each of these different places on the island. Okay, so right before this storm, Salty was sent to collect Fergus from the ironworks and bring him back home to the cement works. The storm occurred en route and put the lighthouse out of action. Salty and Fergus came to its rescue and saved a ship from running aground. An old windmill on Toby's line was struck by lightning during the storm. Toby helped with the reconstruction, and the new windmill was named in his honor. The storm flooded the roads, and in an attempt to find a shortcut around it, Bertie got stuck in the mud and had to be rescued by Edward. On the Scarlowy Railway, the storm damaged the old trestle bridge, and Scarlowy, unaware, nearly fell off it. An old coach was also swept onto the line, which was then salvaged and converted into a tea shop on wheels, served by the refreshment lady. Man, a lot more happened in Season 7 than I remembered.
Kelsthorpe Road was rebuilt into a bigger station with a bay platform for the new branch line to Kirk Ronan. During the reconstruction, Thomas prevented a runaway train from crashing into it. The ground is prepped for an airport in the open space above Kelsthorpe. Construction began, but was delayed when another big storm struck Sodor. This same storm destroyed the suspension bridge across the River Hu. It was quickly rebuilt and mainline services resumed. The original Tidmus Sheds, now showing its age, was demolished, and while the new sheds were being constructed, the engines temporarily relocated. Thomas stayed at Knapbird Sheds with Emily. The new Tidmus Sheds reopened, complete with an extra berth for Emily. Emily relocated from Knapford Sheds permanently to Tidmouth. The ever-expanding Scarlowy Railway became too much for the FAC controller and he hired a new controller to look after it, Mr. Peregrine Percival himself, or as he's commonly known, the Thing Controller. A bunch of new engines that appeared basically once and hardly ever again arrived too, including Molly, Dennis, Neville, and a double-ended Farley called Mighty Mac on the Scarlowy Railway. The bridge for the Peel Godred across the main line fell into disrepair. While it was in the process of being restructured, Neville missed the warning signs and nearly ran right off it. A statue of the main engines was presented to the Northwestern Railway that winter, which went up on display at Abbey Station. Why at Abbey of all places and not, like, Knapford? I have no idea. After his extended stay serving the slate quarry in isolation, Sir Handel finally returned home to normal service on the Scarlowy Railway a much changed engine with a better attitude. Gordon tried to beat his speed record again, and almost did, but he gave it up to help Henry. He did eventually beat the record off screen, and the fat controller presented him a special rake of coaches just for it. Toby's shed at Arlesdale End was rebuilt with a new roof, and the wood from the old roof was repurposed for a birdhouse out front. I'm not gonna lie, that's kinda cute, I like that. This year, Freddy was inexplicably found somewhere off screen was restored and brought to the Scarlowy Railway, where he reunited with Sir Handel and met Scarlowy and Reneus for the first time. Anyone got any ideas of where Freddy might have been this whole time? Maybe a private collector purchased him when the Midsoda engines were auctioned off and then donated him to the Scarlowy later. Who knows? The Northwestern gained a new breakdown crane called Rocky, and also Rosie exists. And also some more steam engines inexplicably arrived. Why not? Just pile them on. The next winter, a snowslide blocked the Scarlowy Railway, and a snub-nosed lorry called Madge transported Duncan via road to the transfer yards from the sheds south of Scarlowy. One fateful day, Duncan sent Thomas on a fool's errand with wrong directions to the wharf to get him lost. En route, Thomas stumbled across the old tracks to Great Waterton. The Fat Controller, thrilled by its rediscovery, saw to it that the town was restored to former glory. Work began, with Thomas relocated to Great Waterton to lead the work. A new engine called Stanley arrived to take over Thomas's duties on his branch line, and then later stayed on the railway after the town was reopened. On Sodor Day that year, a grand reopening celebration was held at Great Waterton. I am very reluctant to continue the timeline after this point because of how terrible Season 12 is, and because The Great Discovery had such a nice ending. But Season 12 is still models, and it references some past episodes, so yeah, it's a part of this, sadly. Peter Sam found the old statue of Proteus in the brush. The statue was polished up and put on display at the showgrounds to commemorate the legend. With Great Waterton's reopening, the Fat Controller had its old tramway tracks to it restored for service. Coincidentally, around the same time, Toby uncovered an old sign for the long-defunct Sodor tramways. The Fat Controller brought a new tram engine called Flora to run the tramway to the town. A big opening celebration, complete with an engine parade, was held at Great Waterton. And, um, that's it. 
In terms of major significance events, that's where the model era of Thomas ends. Not the biggest or the grandest end, but holy moly, what a ride that was. I think when it comes to timelines, the one I, and I assume many others, default to will always be the Railway Series one, as that came from the man himself, Wilbert Audrey. But model era Thomas is a close second for me. It's a totally different history, sure, but it's just as rich in my opinion. This show never stopped world building, even in its later, lesser years, and even at the very end, added on to its already gigantic book of lore. CGI Thomas has its perks, absolutely, but it'll never hold a torch to the all-model sets with real, physical, actual models in front of a camera. Model Thomas was my and many others' childhoods, and created this fandom that we love and know today. Hopefully this fandom's combined efforts will ensure that Model Thomas will continue to make up the childhoods of several other kids. So in case any of you here missed the update video, I have provided a link to the high-res JPEG of the Sodor map I have used in this video. The link to that is in the description below. Feel free to do what you want with it. That's all for me, guys. This was a big one, and I hope you all found this interesting. I'll see you all in the next one, folks. Bye-bye!